Good afternoon and welcome to AMH Conversations. My name is Rumba Zaimengi and this is your program that comes to you every Monday and Thursday where we get a panel of guests in the studio and we dissect all the relevant issues affecting Zimbabwe's national discourse. Today we talk economics and we're looking at rebuilding Zimbabwe's economy. What are the building blocks and exactly what is it going to take to restore Zimbabwe's former glory? To help me have this conversation in depth, I'm very happy to welcome our dynamic panel of guests. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Eddie Cross, who is an economist, as well as a former member of parliament. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We mm -hmm. also have uh, Mr. Chris Mugaga, who is the chief executive officer of the Zimbabwe National Chamber of Commerce. Good afternoon. Welcome, sir. Thank you. And we also have Dr. Chakravarti joining us. He's a former lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe, an economist, and he's also assisting the government with the ease of doing business program. Good afternoon, Mark. So we'll get right into it, and I'll start with you, Mr. Cross. The state of Zimbabwe's economy. We have had a lot of narratives on what went what wrong and which way to go. From your experience, as well as your vast uh, analysis of the situation, can you paint the picture for us? Well, I think we have massive structural problems <clears throat> inherited from the past, and I think those have got to be addressed before we can really look at a sustained growth into the future. But I want to say, to, to start with, that the economy is already growing. Um, at by bridge, the traffic across the bridge this year has grown 17% in the first six months. <clears throat> and I think that's indicative of what's happening in the economy. So I think, number one, <clears throat> we've, come, we, we've broken free from the negative growth or slow growth uh, scenario which prevailed up to end of 2017. And I think the economy has begun to grow. And I think, given the right conditions, it will accelerate very fast. And I think the projections of double-digit growth next year are not fanciful. I think they are realistic. Number one on my list of things that <coughs> the new Minister of Finance has got to attend to is the fiscal deficit. Um, fiscal deficit has been running at $300 million a month. And that's simply unsustainable. Um, that's been leading to printing of money in various forms, and that's resulting in inflation. And inflation is accelerating fast. Um, by the end of this year, if we don't do anything, we're back into hyperinflation. Now, fiscal deficit has got to be resolved by some surgery. You have to, it, no gain without pain. And so we've got to look at re increased revenue, which means higher taxes, and we've got to look at tight controls on expenditure. And uh, I think the new minister must insist that he's given a free hand in both areas. So he's really got to dictate to the cabinet that, that we've got to do these fundamental adjustments. The next thing I would tackle would be monetary policy. We need an independent monetary authority to take control of the monetary situation because at the moment it's completely out of control. And uh, we need an independent board which with really real professionals on it, real experience, which will start laying out what we're going to do about a monetary situation. We've got to stop the queues at the banks. We've got to introduce more liquidity. We've got to put the Reserve Bank back onto a solid position. And that's huge. The next P, in my view, is exchange control. Exchange control is not working. In fact, it's damaging our economy. Uh, we are taking productive assets from our exporters and moving them into unproductive areas. We're subsidizing the price of imported items now, very really, very dramatically. I mean, the US dollar now, whatever we say, is trading at $2, $2.10, $2.20 to the US dollar. And uh, that means we've got the cheapest fuel in the world. Uh, that's why consumption's up. That's why there are shortages. You know, you can't ignore the market. If, it, if any, any politician who thinks he can ignore the market is a disaster waiting for happen, to happen. And I don't think Mtuli is in that league. Mtuli is a very clever guy. And uh, I'd say one of, the, <clears throat> one of the best minds in the world. <clears throat> and we're incredibly lucky to have him. But if we shackle him, as previous ministers of finance have been shackled, uh, I think that it will create se severe difficulties. So for me, those are the three fundamental 
initial steps. Mm. If he does that, he's walking on water <laughs> by the end of the year. Uh, indeed, uh, we, we hope <laughs> that we, we can get to that. Then we can come to you, Mr. Ngo, as, as the man in charge of the, you, the, the, the ZNCC, your main functional mandate really relates to commerce and issues of revenue. And this is something that Mr. Cross has highlighted as being very pivotal in actually revitalizing and rejuvenating the economy. What is your stance coming from, uh, from the standpoint of what are the challenges that have plagued uh, the, the people that you represent under the chamber? And what is it that is really hindering uh, the flow of this revenue in Africa? Well, yes, uh, indeed, it's, it's, it's a commercial economy. And look at it using that eye. I think definitely when you have such structural imbalances, as, as you know, they are there, uh, where the supply side of the economy is naturally dwindled. Uh, you look at the fiscal imbalances, I think it has become a tool uh, to the extent that uh, even strangers in the economic field will know very well that there's something wrong with the spending. Uh, which we talk about every day. Notwithstanding that, maybe we also are away coming from business. Uh, that one of the challenges we always had in this economy, and I call it the lack of independence of institutions. I always try to, to emphasize on that. You might have the best minister in the world. I, I don't expect much personally coming from ministers for the simple reason that uh, in Africa, when you deal with politics, Politics is much stronger. We have got two strong political parties. You go to UK, they call it a too strong executive. You go to maybe Israel, the top of a too strong dominion and small factions in the government. But what we have here, we want a case where a second tier minister, maybe coming from the ruling party, will remain much powerful than the one who will be operating from the government or the city of government. <coughs> and it's our hope that. The trick will not necessarily emanate from the personalities. Mm -hmm. Just going across the board, I think you know very well, when South Africa thought it had made a wrong mistake to call for a minister coming from a small town, he was a mayor, yeah? mm -hmm. so this is Jonas, I think most of you know about this man. When he was appointed in a space of that friend, so he it was by Zuma, then everyone was complaining, why would we have such a minister? Then came uh, Chakanene, he is, he's the current minister. In almost a decade, South Africa had not gone into the session, but today it is with so called one of the most credible ministers. So I think our systems, institutions in Africa, remain a threat to success of the economies. Right now, we're talking about real income economy without being pessimistic, but maybe at the same time, you need to wear a jacket of a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. For starters, maybe to strangers, when you talk of an upper middle income economy, which the president of this country is talking about. In terms of a nation where you're looking at gross national income per capita of no less than 3,000 US dollars, it's a range of almost 3,000 to 12,000. Any figure below 3,000 becomes a low medium income, of which you're talking about in upper middle income. Countries which are typical of upper middle income, if you want to know today, you talk of your Malaysia, you talk of your China, you know these big economies, Singapore. So it can be open the park next year, you talk about Philippines maybe joining that category. So as a nation, I think we need to be so bad to have a strong appreciation of what you mean when you talk of middle income. Uh, it's true, it's possible to certainly record a double digit growth. Coming from a very low base we are in, as you ask you about the membership of where I'm coming from, the major challenge remains foreign currency. Mm -hmm. uh, what is funny maybe though is for me, Forex is not unique to Zimbabwe. Today you go to Nigeria, there is an exchange rate for those who are even sending kids to school outside Nigeria. Mm -hmm. and, and the rate for people like Danote who could be more positioned. You go to Senegal, you go to most countries in Africa, Forex is not unique even to Zimbabwe. Once you don't have an economy <coughs> which is functioning, or a way you have an economy where most cylinders are not firing, save for one. And for years, I think you see the only thing in the firing was the mining sector. It, it, it tends to, to, to prove that you can't have a stable currency. This is the reason why every time I stand up there, I always say Zimbabwe does not have a current crisis. Once we saw this, I think I'm deeper than what even with Professor Shackleton on this. 
uh, once you solve the structural imbalances in an economy, sometimes you see current choice will naturally take a, a automatic or spontaneous route to Kenya economy. So for now, I will certainly see this economy as a typical working text in the book, but I don't want to it. You know, it's sick, but it, there is room for it to, to grow. We need to bring confidence, and the new administration, which we have seen, uh, Mr. Nagagwa bringing on board, I think we have seen the new permanent secretary standing on board, quite very inspiring if you look at the lineup, you know, the language of the old guard, where people feel like, because I am, I deserve to be the in this country. And I have every reason to believe the new rooms who have come into office, as long as they're willing to listen to the important stakeholders on the ground, this economy will take shape. So the prospects are quite bright, but it involves a lot of sacrifices beyond political rhetoric. What you don't want is too much time left out later. So we come to you, Dr. Chakravarti. Yeah. I mean, uh, Mr. Mgaga has already uh, highlighted an issue that is very, very, very crucial to the functioning of an economy, which is the issue of currency. Um, and and I'd, I'd want to, to, to hear your views on that. Uh, and also, perhaps, the, the, the issue of the ease of doing business as well, and how that will actually then whether conflate or actually um, assist uh, in getting the, the gears grinding right. Thank you. Well, firstly, I must say that uh, Eddie and Chris have said it all. So there's, there's really not that much more for me to add. Mm. <coughs> Just to reassert some of the points that they have said. Um, you know, if there is a primary problem in Zimbabwe, it's government's over expenditure, mm -hmm. um, which over the years has gone out of control and we've got an enormous fiscal deficit. And that is the primary reason why we've got inflation. That's the primary reason why we have foreign exchange shortage. It's the primary reason why we have a cash shortage as well. <clears throat> so unless that is addressed, all the other solutions that we may talk about, whether it's, um, <clears throat> and there I agree with Chris, it doesn't matter whether it's this currency or that currency, monetary reform, uh, they are all needed, but they will fail if we do not address this fundamental underlying factor, which is the fiscal deficit. So that's the first issue. Um, <clears throat> but you asked me specifically on currency. Um, I think the position taken by the Minister of Finance is correct. Um, I, I was against the bond note when it was first came up. In fact, it was a ZNCC uh, <coughs> Congress or meeting, I think in 2016, when the Governor of the Reserve Bank was invited, and um, I was also, and the Governor spoke about the bond note. And I must say, I was very bold. I stood up at that time and I said, I'm completely against the issuance of this bond note. Please don't do it. Of course, we went ahead and did it. And we have seen the consequences. Mm -hmm. Now my position is a little bit different um, <clears throat> in that there is no question about it that we do need a local currency. But this is something down the road. Okay. It cannot be introduced now. There's lack of confidence. There's lack of the economic fundamentals to introduce it. <clears throat> but my view about the bond note is that it is a currency which is in circulation in Zimbabwe. So rather than thinking about it as a surrogate US dollar, we should think about it as a surrogate Zim dollar. It is already trading in the market. It's being used as a local currency. It has an exchange rate with the US dollar. Mm -hmm. There's only about 400 million in circulation. So I believe that it's quite a nice stepping stone towards an, a local currency. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a small amount. It's relatively under control. And all the Reserve Bank has to do is actually issue uh, a, a general notice tomorrow to say that the peg between the US dollar and the bond note has been removed. In other words, it's accepting what the market is already doing. The market is already allowing the US dollar to trade against the bond note, and the people are doing it in 4th Street across the border in South Africa. We just have to accept that. We just regularize it, we legalize it, and let that be another local currency within the multi-currency framework. And then people get used to the idea that yes, there's multi-currency, there's US dollar and rand and everything else, but there's also this paper which has some value and it's a local currency. And going forward, maybe in six months or one year or two years, that can gradually build into a proper local currency. So that would be the appropriate way to go. Uh, the second thing about foreign exchange is that I think our foreign exchange management system is inappropriate and it's causing the shortages. Um, and I think there needs to be a complete liberalization of the system. Um, what really needs to be do, we are earning about $5.5 billion 
at the moment overall in total exports, as per the remittances and everything else. <clears throat> we need about two billion of that for essential imports, like fuel, power, cooking oil, sugar, wheat, and such things. So obviously those are controlled items, and foreign exchange has to be allocated to those to keep the price level down, and uh, you know so that you don't affect the common person too much. Um, and that would also be politically difficult if the prices of such things went down. But the balance of three and a half billion which is coming in should actually be become part of a legal interbank uh, foreign exchange market. Mm. Now, again, I'm saying let's learn from the market. This is already happening. Mm. What is currently happening is that exporters, uh, you know, get their money in their nostrils, and they are actually reselling this their foreign exchange to importers through the banking system. Mm. Now, according to the laws of the regulations of the Reserve Bank. This is illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are turning a blind eye to it because there's no other way. Mm -hmm. So we are already permitting foreign exchange trading, but under the carpet or under the table. Why? Let's open it up. Let's do it properly. Let's have an open, transparent foreign exchange market. And then the government and the Reserve Bank can regulate it properly. Mm -hmm. So my, my recommendations are, yes, uh, we need to deal with the fiscal deficit, first and foremost. And it would be good if. They, uh, Eddie was just mentioning that perhaps there should be a mini budget in advance of the main budget. That's, that's, not, that's not a bad idea. Something which builds confidence that the finance minister can now show that even in advance of November or whenever the budget comes up, right now we're trying to do a few things. And there are some possibilities. I mean, we all have ideas and we're happy to share it with him. And I'm sure he has his own ideas as well. So fiscal deficit is number one. Uh, number two is to start looking at uh, uh, addressing the foreign exchange management system. Mm. This doesn't necessarily involve bringing in the Zim dollar or taking any hard decisions. It's just a question of how foreign exchange is managed and to what extent the trading in foreign exchange can be legalized and liberalized so that it comes, it happens within the banking system. And finally, the bond note, I believe, I agree it should not be withdrawn at this time, although four years ago I was very much against it. I think it should be uh, included in the multi-currency basket, and trading should be allowed in a legal manner. <coughs> so these are some of the things I think would help to alleviate, uh, not, to re not solve the situation, but at least to help uh, resolve some of these things in the short term. I'm looking at it in a very short term. I think if some of these things are done, then we'll start seeing benefits even in, within the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. Um, come to you, Mr. Cross. The issue of decriminalizing or perhaps regulating the activities of the money changes, you're talking about uh, you know, the rate now being at what, 225%, I believe. Is, 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 will this, in, in your opinion, Well, first, so? first of all, you get nowhere by criminalizing it. Mm -hmm. I think this, this is a legitimate economic activity, mm -hmm. and uh, whether we like it or not, they are playing a role. In fact, there would be chaos out there if they weren't in the market. It's like cross-border traders. Um, I mean, you know, we could take a whole informal sector. This is one of the most informalized economies in the world. And you could probably, the Minister of Finance might say, or somebody other, other bureaucrat might say that 50% of the informal sector is doing illegal, act, illegal things. Sure, but the reality is that we as a country could not survive without those mechanisms in place. So my view is that we've got to liberalize. We've got to establish formal markets. I mean, if we adopt the solution regarding the exchange control that's been mooted for the three and a half billion dollars that is being traded outside the essential needs portfolio, uh, that would bring a lot of money back into the banking system would create a formal market for, for those, that currency and would be in the open. We have a published exchange rate on a daily basis. And I think that would free up everybody. But I think what, what we've been talking about up to now, and I don't know if you disagree with me, is like an emergency program. <clears throat> um, these are the essential things the minister has to do immediately. If he doesn't, I want to tell you, we're headed for chaos. I mean, let's remember 2008, 17th of, 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 of January, 17th of November 2008, I was sitting in Parliament when Chinamasa stood up to announce liberalization, no exchange control, no restrictions on gold, 
lifting in price control, except introducing the multi currency, abandoning the Zimbabwe dollar. We forget there was no fuel in the market. It hadn't been for five years. There was no food in the supermarkets. The supermarkets were empty. Every bank was broke. Every insurance company was broke. Everybody's pensions had vanished. We, we were in a severe economic collapse. And that 15 minute announcement by the minister transformed the country. And it was BT's fundamental mandate of we eat what we kill, which means no fiscal deficit. And the reason why he succeeded there because he was prepared to be tough with the president and, the, and say to the president, no, president, you can't do that. But the moment that GNU collapsed, those disciplines disappeared. The new minister has to reintroduce that on an emergency basis. But if you want to look at the longer term issues, I've got a list as long as you're on. <laughs> okay? For me, there are other things which we need to think about. Absolutely. Right. Import restrictions. Oh. You know what that does? It creates corruption. Oh. I have one of, one, one of my friends, one of the biggest importers in the country. He hasn't received one import license in the last nine months. Not one. He has to buy his licenses from people who get licenses. Okay. Okay? Why do you think a box of cornflakes in Harare costs four times the price in Johannesburg. Hmm? Well, to subsidize, yeah. I suppose, for, for all of that. You're buying the foreign exchange on the black market mm -hmm. at 220%. Mm -hmm. You're paying somebody for the import license. You're, you're paying the duties at the border. You're paying a runner to do this and that and so on. And the price, the price huge inflation. Mm -hmm. Inflation in imported goods in this country has been over 100% in the last nine months. That's the reality, over 100%. And, and let's not, I don't know where, this, where the statistics department get their statistics from. But if you speak to anybody on the street, that's the reality. Mm. So import restrictions open up. If you want to slap a duty on, you do a trump. 25% on everything manufactured on mm. at the border mm. for everybody mm. and everything. Then there's the rule of law. Okay? You know, people, businessmen have got to know where they stand. You know, if I if if I enter into a contract in Zimbabwe, will it be respected? Will the legal system enforce my rights as an investor? You know, and that applies to property rights throughout. You know, the Canadians invested in a gold mine outside Quekwe. It was invaded four months ago by Makorokozo. They were unable to mine. Appeals to the authorities yielded nothing. Yeah. That is madness. Who is going to invest in the country when we're doing those sort of things? So there has to be the rule of law. There has to be respect for property rights. You know, and you could go on. Uh, I think what's critical for us, insofar as international engagement, is going to be political reform. I think the international community is going to demand two things from us. I'm including China and India, the entire world. First is economic reform, systematic, comprehensive, holistic economic reform to end the perpetual crisis that is in Zimbabwe, because we can. The second is political reform, to deliver a democratic government in 2023. Let's accept that our present government is legitimate, because I think he won the election. I've got no doubt about that. He did beat the opposition, and he got a majority. Right, now let's get on with it. But 2023, if by 2023 we've built a system which can be respected internationally, I think the international community, I think the World Bank could be here tomorrow. I think the IMF will engage with us before Christmas. We'll have a new, a new uh, what they call a staff monitored system program by January 2019. Yeah, the world is in front of us. And it is indeed our voice. But there's always an issue raised, though, of uh, how the domestic industry perhaps is being booted out uh, in favor of uh, you know, everyone else coming in and was ever open. Are we too open? And often these questions are thrown around. Well, what's your, 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 your vantage point on that? And I'll also come to you, um, Chris, to help you answer that. 
I was the secretary, I, you know, when I was general manager of the dairy board in the early 80s, visitors used to visit me from abroad and say, this is an, an industrial museum. Hmm. You know, because the technology we were using was 40, 50, 60 years old. Hmm. I was the director of the biggest shoe factory in the country in Bulawayo. We employed 3,500 employees. Our productivity was 15% of our Chinese counterparts. 15%, mm. you know? So we have got to modernize our production. The biggest shoe plant in Africa is now run by a woman in Ethiopia. And what she did was from scratch, she built a plant with the best technology. She imported the best production lines from Italy and other parts of the world and China. And she is now aggressively exporting into the major markets of the world. And she's, and she's bigger than Barter in Africa. Mm. And so it can be done. Mm. But it requires investment. It requires, And the worst thing we can do is protect inefficient production. The worst thing we can do. We've got to force our businessmen to face reality and get their business together. And if we've got are running a business here which cannot compete, with the international international market, well then, don't try and compete, okay. and don't ask for protection. You know how guys run to and seek protection for what they're doing, mm. when in fact I think we should be aggressively trying to exploit regional markets. We can produce dairy products here at a fraction of the cost in other countries, mm. but we're importing seventy-five percent of our milk product. What's wrong with that? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McCarthy, uh, we'll come to you on that. What, what is your view on that? How do we protect the domestic investor, the person who is in Zimbabwe, trying to make a business? I think the trick doesn't necessarily lie in protecting. Mm. If you would ask, I would certainly say, he certainly is resident, mm. supporting. Mm -hmm. Yes. What could be happening across the world today when you see the economics trading on every country? I think you can see the trade wars today between Washington and Beijing. You saw it, mm -hmm. anything the North African free trade agreement. Zimbabwe is pushing towards ratifying the Conenda free trade area. I think you are seeing it through a signature in March of this year in Kigali, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So the issue of protectionism, I don't see clearly any space anymore, unless mm -hmm. if we are not aware of what it means in our intentions to join the free trade area. We had a lot of complaints, especially from these days, mm -hmm. arguing to say the open for business is somehow crawling out mm -hmm. our capacity. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think with proper policies in place, mm -hmm. just go back to an era where liberalization took place within the banking sector, post-1990, where you saw a lot of global banks coming about, and some of them question why some of them are not yet existing. Mm. But liberalization on its own, there's no evidence that it will crowd out or it will not allow local businesses mm. to compete. However, maybe the structural rigidities and threats quite resident and pronounced in this economy, some of them to do with the political risk, you talk of the sanctions, mm. it can be debatable, but I want to believe the standing of Zimbabwe that has been under that verification, the consumption, I believe they have. It obviously gives us countries we want to compete with an unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. So the here the talk about protectionism, which I'm preparing to be supporting, mm -hmm. it would to a certain extent be justified, especially when you know very well that the relations between Iran with the superpowers have been quite very thought. When you yeah. move on to look at the current dynamics, I think it's not a secret that the Green Bank, US dollar, is overvalued. Mm -hmm. If you look at figures, maybe on average you talk about forty percent. And that on its own. It's, it's, it's a threat to ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to what extent can we produce the same share at a competitive rate vis-a-vis -vis someone in Houghton? Mm -hmm. These are the realities we need to look at as I'm coming from business. Mm -hmm. So, yes, support is needed, but support is not necessarily needed through the loans you see. The policy environment is the best dividend you can put to the business community. Mm -hmm. I think evidence is probably the case we can write about how doling out resources, the money or fuel is not why this is grown. And uh, then Gideon Gone, the center of the governor, running up to almost, uh, I think from 2003, he said when he came in office, 
you saw how people benefited through quantitative easing, mm -hmm. which did not translate to either productivity or even production increasing. So we certainly need Indonesian exposure. We need companies from abroad. Today in China, why it is where it is. Every time an investor will come to China, the question was, how are we going to partner? However, if you ask Mr. Trump today, the wars with China, he's arguing to say China does not respect intellectual property rights because if one of the companies, Facebook, Google, Apple, they come to China, the issue is Chinese will demand to say, can we be strategic partners in it? That's the reason why you see even most of the Apple products, they are made in China even though the technology is resident in Silicon Valley. So it's how we move in terms of our laws. We've got a joint venture act, policies are already in How do you attract companies? But like what Eddie said, proper rights, the sanctity of proper rights, the issue of land, it had created a bad precedent for Zimbabwe. And the end of the day, the president of Zimbabwe, the new president, will wake up to the reality that what happened post land reform, Today's case in Zimbabwe, why we are asking case, mm -hmm. you can try to discover theories of why Zimbabwe is important, right? But the major reason is to do with how the land reform which was rushed, mm -hmm. not only affected the production in the farms, but even in the manufacturing sector. Looking mm -hmm. at the manufacturing sector, we are talking of an industry where almost 70% 5 percent of our manufacturing sector is agro-related, it's mm -hmm. agro-processing. Mm -hmm. If you want to pick any meaningful company in our manufacturing sector, and this also affected even banking because you now see non performing loans. Yeah, that bad someone. But it's not making business sense. So the whole value chain, it has to be interrogated. But supporting domestic industry is good. But protecting, I tell you, it can only create more and more inefficiencies. We don't have water. Go to a special economy so today, like uh, Masasa and the Sunway City. Mm -hmm. Where investors were complaining coming from our side to say, look, as much as they made it a special economic zone. Amenities. But mm. there are no amenities. Mm. Today, let me tell you, today's special economic zone, what makes it attractive? It's not only just the mere talk of saying tax concession. Mm. Some governments mm. have gone into the extent of offering grants mm. to those who come into invest mm. in Indonesia two, three years. Mm. So I think it's all it all lies in policy uh, consistency. I think we had talk about it. Before we came, he is quite a very super minister. Mm. The talk was, we shall we bono to this. I think it's the tone which we need to get in unison. Mm -hmm. One of the conflicting statements, that's but just a recipe for the very disaster which was in there before. We need to have police consistency. Corruption, I think it's also one of the reasons why doing this in Zimbabwe remains very difficult. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with corruption? Mm -hmm. In this government, I'll tell you the problem we have sometimes in the unfair authorities they are listening. Most of the trials, they take place in the media. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to Tell the people that someone has been arrested. You want to be told, you, know, you don't need that. <laughs> when corruption is to be handled, let it be handled. You mm. only hear that prosecution is taken place. Mm -hmm. And what is even worrisome some of all this? Most of the people you see being arrested right now, there are people, for example, who are former ministers. Mm -hmm. Why can't I see ministers being arrested? Are you saying people become more corrupt after office work? Mm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a case of the number of factors why we have these challenges. Confidence can only come if we utilize our judiciary even to deal with the executive. But what we're having at the moment where you see only ministers facing the courts after mm -hmm. leaving office, the continent issue will be itself thinking that maybe executive is too, too powerful for even the judiciary. Mm -hmm. So those are the issues we want to see as business. And once that is addressed, I tell you investment will come rule of law once it's expected. Mm -hmm. Doing business in such an economy becomes easier. Then if you have the best currents, mm -hmm. you seem to have the best economic zones when people believe after investing, you don't respect the subject of their property. Mm -hmm. I tell you, it can only but a, 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 a dream to, to think of attracting more investment. Mm -hmm. But Section 70 of our constitution talks about mm -hmm. property rights and yeah. how they must be respected. Absolutely. So it's, it's a case of implementation, really, if, if I'm getting it's, it's, right. it's an implementation, not just put on paper. Because mm -hmm. I think Justice Gabe, when he would interpret law and let the form to place, to them it was illegal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, but sometimes you need them to align your laws and also to interpret it well. But what I emphasize on is independence of institutions. Mm -hmm. Once institutions are independent, I can assure you, sometimes you don't need to, to, to have trouble mm -hmm. implementing. Look at the last event where even the whole nation was glued to television, waiting for election as house for presidential election. It's mm -hmm. not health. Relations should be respected through an institution if they seek the results are there. Mm -hmm. 
But the moment you see everyone thinking there's a second tier source which can give another source of results, mm -hmm. it shows institutions are not functioning. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need to correct in this yeah. country. Mm -hmm. so, the issue of uh, state capture, I believe, uh, is very relevant. And uh, the lack of, I suppose, the bureaucracy taking over the technocracy in institutions. Are there any measures for writing this? Are there any measures for introducing more of the technocrats and easing off some of the bureaucracy that's actually arresting progress? One thing I just want to confirm, if you look at the history of development, mm -hmm since the Second World War. It is those countries which have had good policies, which have progressed and had sustainable and high rates of growth. Mm -hmm. It has nothing whatsoever to do with money and investment. Mm -hmm. When you have good policies in place, mm -hmm. which allow the productive energies of both the domestic people and the foreign people to come, then you have high rates of growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so money comes automatically when you have good policies. Mm -hmm. So that's where the focus should be. Not on trying to find, uh, you know, this investor and that investor uh, for the international financial institution. You get your policies right, the money automatically comes. That is the history of development for the last 70 years. So that must uh, that uh, must be emphasized. I just want to go back on the question of, um, uh, you know, in the long run there is no question, uh, there, there's no doubt that if the, the, our economy is to progress, we've got to have industrialization Absolutely. based on our comparative advantages, which includes, of course, agriculture mm -hmm. and the other natural resources. And so we need an industrialization strategy, which we do not have and we haven't had for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever even had one. Um, now, as part of that um, protection, as my colleagues have said, is not really a fundamental instrument, it actually creates a problem. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the current demand for protection and SI-64, for instance, the reason is because, as Chris is saying, we've been using the US dollar and it's highly overvalued. Mm -hmm. So if you have an overvalued currency, it's difficult for local industry to compete with outside industry. Whereas if you have a weak currency, and the Chinese do this very well, they keep the yuan low vis-a-vis -vis the US dollars. Yeah. And that's uh, how they ima manage to export and get the, keep their industrialization going. So th there's no question about it that in the medium term, we do have to have our own currency which is relatively weak against the US dollar. Mm -hmm. And that will of course remove all these demands for protection. And because it gives automatic protection if you're two to one rather than one to one. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that will be a major factor which will support industrialization. But just also to say that um, our, our, our resources have changed a lot uh, in the last, uh, you know, in the, in the years since independence. So it's not only agriculture, which is very important, of course, but natural resources like all the minerals. But Zimbabwe has a massive pool of human resources which have been created since independence. And unfortunately, governments look at all these human resources purely as providing certain services, like providing health services or education or whatnot. But in fact, these can be the basis for human resource-based industries, which can serve the entire region. And I'll just give you an example of healthcare. Zimbabwe has the potential to become a healthcare hub for the entire region. And we can compete quite easily with South Africa as well. It's just that we don't have policies in place to support the development of a regional healthcare industry in Zimbabwe. We have the doctors, we have the expertise, we have the nurses, we have everything, we have lots of facilities. But we view a hospital as somewhere where we go to be treated. Whereas the government should see that, that whole, the whole health infrastructure as something which can be the basis for a human resource industry for Zimbabwe, which will be a center for the region. So I think our whole perspective on uh, on resources and going forward, how we see the development of Zimbabwe also really needs to be looked at very carefully. Mm -hmm. So a paradigm shift. Really. A paradigm shift in this. Yeah. Yeah. Mindset is very important. Yeah. Good. Well, we're coming fast to the end of our program. So what I'll do is I'll just ask you, um, so across for your parting shots, what words do you have in terms of mapping out the trajectory for a successful <coughs> Well, I think I want to endorse what the President said at the opening of Parliament mm -hmm. in State of the Nation, mm -hmm. where he called for a national concerted effort to get things moving. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. We need all of us to forget our differences and put Zimbabwe first. And then let's start working our way through all the difficulties we have 
This is a very dynamic country. Our GDP is at least double what the official figures say. I think it's more than that. And, and I think our potential to grow is massive. We have the highest ratio of resources to population in the world, in the entire world. So we're a very rich country, potentially. What's needed, you know, we've got to work together. Uh, stop fighting each other. Stop fighting the vendors in the middle of town. They're doing a job, you know. Let's, cu let's cure the real problems. Let's get our policies right. You've got some very, in this cabinet, you've got 10 women. It's a third. Average age is down from 74 to 52. So it's a whole generation. You've got four professors. You've got five technocrats. This is, this is a hopeful team, I think. We have got some, we have got some people who should be in jail. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> but believe me, I think we have everything, really. What needs now is to work together. Yes, so the message is quite very clear. I think after the election, the election year removed the throne over the window. Mm -hmm. You know, political cycle, Zimbabwe, especially related to election, is quite very short. It's nobody, look at it, it's almost two and a half years. Already there is a mood of elections. And the economy, the economy has to be prioritized. I think with this industry, this that the only way forward is to support uh, the new president of the country. Where is wrong, obviously, you don't need to public. It's, it's important to, to have an open mind mm -hmm. on what will build the country. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the language of you know, polarization mm -hmm. also a message to the media. Sometimes you don't say a story by battering the image of the country. I think we need to go beyond the mere rhetoric of even selling a newspaper in the street. But to understand that Zimbabwe will remain for the future generations which we have. And I'm sure with the new team which uh, Mr. Managagwa has set as a president, chances are we might see a shift from the yesteryear years. He also learned because he was part of the favor of the last government. It's not like he's a stranger to this. Mm -hmm. And I want to believe from that we're going to see a difference in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Doc, what are your potential? No, I can't agree with more with my colleagues, but mindset change is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest problems we've had in something that the ease of doing business that we've been working on in the last few years is the mindset amongst the ministries and the regulators. Mm -hmm. They have a small little empire with a few regulations that they hold and they don't want to change. Mm -hmm. But those are completely out of date. Many of them are from the colonial times. Mm -hmm. They are completely unnecessary and uh, you know, uh, they, they retard the progress of the country. So this mindset change is needed. Um, we need to, you know, we, we need to have a buy-in from uh, all these various sectors, all these uh, institutions, uh, to, to start supporting uh, a more open, liberal economy. And at the end of the day, we have to realize that the private sector is the engine of growth. It's not the government. Okay, all over the world in development, the private sector is the leading edge of growth. So the role of government is to facilitate and allow it to go forward. And I think that mindset change needs to come. You should, regulators and ministries shouldn't see themselves as the makers of policy or as the ones who control the environment in that area. No, on the contrary, they are the ones who facilitate. So they are the servants, they are not the masters. And that's what we need to see. Mm. Well, thank you. Well, there you have it. Uh, to all our viewers, it's about working together. Mshandira Pangwe, as, uh, as Mr. Cross put it. And really, a mindset shifting and everyone working together, forgetting the political hangover and actually getting everyone inculcated with a spirit of working together and economic growth. We thank our panel of guests. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Mgali. And thank you, Dr. Chakravarti. We have been coming to you streaming live on Facebook at Newsday Zimbabwe, as well as on our Twitter page at Newsday Zimbabwe, and also on Heart and Soul Radio. Thank you so much for staying tuned. Do join us on Monday for yet another exciting edition of AMH Conversations. My name is Rupert Zayvengi. Have a wonderful afternoon.